My name is Dr. Sile Raphael Taiwo, a consultant uh, anesthetist with FMC Lokoja. And uh, I'm the current publicity secretary from the public relations officer of the Nigerian Society of Anesthetists. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll start in a few moments, but if you have a question, please, um, you can you know, drop them in the chat box as the webinar is going out. And the, at the end of the webinar, we can be attend to your questions. Thank you very much. Can you let me know when I can start? Okay, sir. So can you see the slide? Yes, I can. Okay, so I can start. Okay, good evening once again, everyone. Um, to talk on anesthesia and pain management. And let me start by saying it will be absolutely impossible to make you or pain experts within this just one hour. But I will try as much as possible to stimulate your interest in the management of pain. And so I intend to look at this presentation using the following outlines. Next slide. Introduction. And what is pain? The definition of anesthesia. History of pain management. Types of pain. We look at pathophysiology of pain, assessment of pain, the overview of pain management, then we'll summarize and conclude. Next slide. Next slide, please. By way of introduction, pain is said to be the most common symptom of a disease and is very often the first pointer to a deviation from the normal functioning of different parts of human body. As we often see in our hospital, more than 70 to 80% of patients that come to clinic or that come to hospital comes because of one pain in one part of the body or the other. So management of pain constitutes a significant burden anywhere in the world. And this is not too different in our own country, as it has been a recurring challenge across the country. 
In Nigeria, hospitals, several reports on post-operative pain management have demonstrated infrequent assessment, poor diagnosis, and inadequate treatment among patients. And one of the factors that has been identified to be responsible for this poor pain management is the poor knowledge of healthcare professionals in the comprehensive management of pain. Next slide. So, what is pain? According to International Association for the Study of Pain, which came up with a definition in 1979 and defined pain as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience that is associated with actual or potential tissue damage or that is described in terms of such damage. But this definition has been around for like over 40 years and it was reviewed in 2018. And by 2020, this definition was updated to the current one in 2020 by the same International Association of the Study of Pain. As, so pain is now being defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that is associated with or resembling that associated with. Now you can see that a clause has been included, which is or resembling that associated with. So even if it's not associated with it, but it's resembling it, the actual or potential tissue damage. Now pain is always a personal experience and it is influenced to varying degrees by biological, psychological, and social factors. What are we saying? That is pain is subjective. It is whatever the person who is experiencing it says it is, that is pain. A person's report of experience as pain should be respected. Hence, pain is always subjective. Next slide. So what is the correlation between anesthesia or anesthesiology and pain? What is the definition of anesthesia? According to our own Baba, that's Sojourn Commando O.O. Oladapo, he defined anesthesia as a specialization of medicine that deals with reversible, controllable, and predictable methods of pain relief for operative surgery with or without loss of consciousness. Now you can see in this definition that everything is geared towards pain relief for patients that are to undergo surgery, either preoperatively, post uh, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. So it is the medical specialty that is concerned with the total perioperative care of patients that is before, during, and after surgery. It encompasses anesthesia, critical care medicine, and emergency care medicine, and even pain medicine. So in the next slide, I'm going to show us the versatility of an anesthetist. Next slide. Now, this slide talks about how God created Eve from Adam, thereby making God the first anesthetist. Next slide. For those of us who are Christian, you know that Eve was taken from the rib of Adam when he fell asleep, when God put him to sleep. So God was the first anesthetist by putting Adam to sleep. Next slide, okay? Now, we want to look at who is an anesthetist or how or where does an anesthetist function, an anesthesiologist. Uh, by the way, it is the Americans that cause anesthesiologist, that is the physician anesthetist, why the British, the Britain, or Britain, call anesthetist. So you can use the two words interchangeably, anesthetist. But because we commonly also find people using nurse anesthetist, you can differentiate it by saying you are a physician anesthetist. But in the US, once you say you are an anesthesiologist, everybody knows that you are a doctor who has specialized in anesthesia. So an anesthesiologist is a superman doctor. He's not just in the operating room, like most people would believe, 
but you can see that an anesthesiologist work in the operating room as a perioperative physician. They also work in the labor world and delivery suits where we offer pain services to patients in labor. There are other places like in the procedural areas like intensive care units, post-operative care units, even in MRI, there are some patients who may want to undergo such procedure and may not be able to, I may not cooperate. And then you have to call for an anesthetist to put the patient to sleep so that patient can cooperate for MRI, CT scan, when you have a small child. Then topmost is pain management, either acute pain or chronic pain. And in emergency medicine, cold blue team, respiratory therapy, administration, in operating room, hospital, medical school, education, health professional, we are also involved in research and we are also managers. So you can see that an anesthetist is a superman doctor. Uh, I wasn't able to show you one particular picture that shows the versatility of um, an anesthetist. An anesthetist is someone who must have a very big bladder that can store urine so that while you are operating patient, you don't need to be running up and down because you want to urinate. And you must also have a very small stomach so that you don't easily get hungry. And then you must have eyes everywhere. You must be very, very vigilant and observant because vigilant is our own eternal safety. Next slide. Next slide. Now, what is the history of pain management? The struggle to manage pain in patients effectively and safely has long been an issue in medicine. And tracing back this history of pain management therapy is often complicated by the fact that, historically speaking, many of the past pain treatment options can be credited to multiple nationalities. And one of the earliest forms of therapy came from a compound called salicylic acid However, the turning point for this type of pain management occurred in the 18th century and 19th centuries. Raphael Piria and Joseph Bochner and other scientists work on altering the formula slightly into what we now know today as what? As aspirin. So aspirin is actually the, that we can call the first analgesic. And the use of opioid traced back to the 1600s and uh, where morphine and heroin became commonplace in 1900s. Uh, because of the addictive tendencies of morphine, this led to development of pain management as medical field in 1960s. Next slide. Next slide. So this is just to show us picture of some forerunner in this uh, pain management. Next one. Next slide. Steven Waldman was the first anesthesiologist who practiced pain management in the US and is the founder of the Society for Pain Practice Management and was one of the leader of interventional pain management. Next slide. Now, types of pain. How do you classify pain? Now, pain can be classified or categorized in several ways. You can classify pains based on the duration of that pain. Commonly, we say acute and chronic pain. When we talk about acute pain, it means pains that the duration is less than one month, is between one month. When has this patient been having this pain? We say within one month. And if the pain is more than three months, you say this is chronic pain. Some other persons also say six months. But generally, what is accepted is acute pain is any pain less than one month. It becomes chronic when it is more than three months. So in between the, the uh, one month and three months is subacute pain. Then you can classify pain based on the pathophysiological mechanism. Is it a nociceptive or neuropathic pain? Nociceptive pain are usually from tissue damage. Why neuropathic pain as a result of 
organ damage. And we can talk about neuropathic pain like in the case of diabetic pain. And nociceptive pain like if you just injure your hand, like putting your hand in a hot object. So nociceptive pain are usually acute pain, while neuropathic pain are usually chronic pain. Then you can also classify pain based on what part of the body or the anatomical location. People having chest pain, low back pain, abdominal pain, etc., etc. Then what, or you can also classify pain based on the cause of this pain. We have neoplastic and non-neoplastic pain. Of course, when we talk about neoplastic pain, these are pains caused by, or that are cancer-related. And non-neoplastic pains are not cancer-related. There could also be psychogenic pain. And there could be also, we could also classify pain as refer pain. Now, we we'll go to the pathophysiology of pain. Basically, when we talk about the pathophysiology of pain, we look at it from the signal transduction, the transmission, then the perception, or we call it integration, and then the modulation of this. So pain, usually, when there is tissue injury, it immediately leads to inflammation. This is what we know from our pathology. And once there is inflammation, there will be release of, medical, of, of mediators, of chemical mediators. For example, substance P, prostaglandins, serotonins, and acetylcholine. And when we are going to be talking about the management of, it, of this pain, these are some of the mediators that some of these uh, pain um, treatments try to modulate or try to block. So you have nociceptive or peripheral uh, uh, nociceptive receptor, which this peripheral nerve pick once there is injury and there will be signal transduction through the peripheral nerve. There are actually about two types of nerve. We have the A delta nerve and the C fiber nerve. Uh, the, the A delta carry the fast um, uh, pain recept uh, receptor, while the C fiber carry the slow pain receptor. And this goes into the spinal cord. It's depreciation. Uh, uh, information to the other side of the spinal cord, and this is now transmitted. That is transmission through the spinal thalamic tract. This also carry temperature too, through the uh, uh, spinal thalamic tract to the thalamus. So we have the first order neuron from this peripheral nerve getting to the dorsal root ganglion. And from dorsal root ganglion through the uh, in the spinal cord, we have the second order neuron stopping in the thalamus and the third order neuron from the thalamus to the higher cerebral cortex, where this pain will be interpreted. And then there is, this is, this is what we call the ascendant pathway of the uh, pain uh, pathophysiology. Why the uh, descending pathway? Through this cerebral, uh, the higher centers, there will be modulation of these chemicals and it will lead to generation of inhibitory mediators like opioid peptides, non-epinephrine, glycine, and um, GABA. That's glutamate aminobutyric acid. So through the descending pathway, through the brainstem, it now goes back to the spinal cord and then this pain of the patient is reduced. Next slide. Next slide, okay. Now, this is exactly what I've just explained. Transduction, transmission is a relay in the spinal cord, then goes to the thalamus. From thalamus, it sends it to the higher center where there will be interpretation and in the integration and interpretation of this um, uh, stimulus, that is perception. And then through the descending pathway, it will be modulated. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Now, how do we assess pain? Pain assessment is the cornerstone of a successful patient pain management. Effective clinical management of pain ultimately depends on its accurate assessment, which entails comprehensive evaluation of the patient's pain, symptoms, clinical history, 
and functional status. Now, the critical elements of the assessment of pain include one, normal what we do in our medical school, you take patient history, physical examination, and then you do pain measurements. Now, this is pain intensity scale. We have different types here. I have the visual analog scale, the numeric rating scale, the VABA rating scale, and Wombaker faces pain rating scale. Let me say that the Wombaker faces rate, uh, pain rating scale is for children, for children that may not be able to vocalize, that may not be able to talk, that may not be able to carry out the instruction we will give to them in the case, in, like in the case of VABA rating scale, numeric rating scale, and the visual analog scale. So you look at the expression of the face of the patient, and then you score from zero to 10. The zero is usually no pain, and 10 is worst pain. So when we talk about verbal rating scale, in verbal rating scale, you draw a line from zero to 10, or you tell the patient, this zero represents no pain. 10 means your worst possible pain. And then you ask the patient to choose that's how you assess pain. And then in the numeric rating scale, you ask the patient to draw on a scale of one to 10. You should just mark where is the, what, what, what form of pain? Is it no pain, moderate pain, or worse pain? And then in verbal rating, a visual analog scale, there is a chart you give to the patient. So all these things are semantics. The good thing is that you are able to communicate with the patient, and the patient is able to communicate back to you. But let me say that in pain assessment, don't forget that you must talk about the what are the things that provoke this patient pain when you are taking your history. What are the things that palliate this patient pain? Where does this pain radiate to in this patient? What is the severity of this pain? And how long has this pain been there? So we have a mnemonic for it. We call it PQRST, how to assess pain when you go to clock your patient. Next slide. Next slide. So I'm gradually rounding up since it's just to stimulate our appetite, so to speak or our interest in pain management. Now, when we talk about treatment methods in managing pain, you must understand that the management of any pain will depend on what type of pain, how long has this pain been there? So you have to individualize your patients. There is no one straight jacket, one size fits all for everyone you must in individualize your patient. And this treatment method could be pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic. It could be that you want to marry the two together. At this point, let me also state that there are consequences if pain is not adequately managed or effectively and safely managed. And when we do not manage pain well, or when we allow pain to linger for too long, there are psychological and physiological consequences. For example, one of the physiological consequences is that you see the patient will develop tachycardia, high blood pressure, and then hyperventilates going into alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. They can even have depressed immunity. And then you talk about the psychological effects. Pain can actually teach a patient to depression to even having to say that addition and say, okay, let me just leave and then maybe by the time I die, this pain will be off my neck. So you see why it is very, very important to manage pain well. So, like I said, it can be non-pharmacological or pharmacological. So when we talk about the non-pharmacological method, that's when we're talking about the phys physical method and psychological method. 
like physiotherapy, manipulation, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, acupuncture, ice packs. Then we talk about relaxation, relaxation, psychoprophylaxis, and hypnosis. All these can be used to manage pain. But when we now talk about the pharmacological uh, treatment, now these can be non-opioids or opioids. Our non-opioids will include paracetamol, that's what we call the acetaminophens, and then the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin. And then this would one too can be classified into the non-selective and selective uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Then you can also have opioid, like morphine, fentanyl, petidine, sofentanyl, afentanyl, etc., etc. Then as anesthetist, we also have some form of intervention or procedure that we do in taking care of pain. For example, if someone is having low back pain, you can actually inject what we call epidural steroid injection. That means you put a local anesthetic agent into the epidural space to help alleviate that pain. And over the years, people have found out that this works very fine for patients. We can also do what is called nerve blocks. There are different kinds of nerve blocks to, to alleviate pain. And we also have spinal anesthesia. So these are all the various modalities, various ways by which pain can be alleviated. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk briefly, and this will be the last one, on the WHO three-step analgesic ladder. And this was actually developed in 1986. WHO came up with how to manage patients who have cancer, who develop cancer pain, patients with cancer who also have pain. And but over the years, people have adapted this to any other kind of pain. So when you are seeing a patient, for the first time coming to complain of pain, you start from a mild analgesic until you gradually increase to a more complex one, depending on the severity of patient's pain. Now, you us we usually start with non-opioid analgesics, that is, our usual non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and acetaminophen, that is paracetamol, aspirin, ibuprofen, um, um, pyrozicam, diclofenac, etc., etc. We have ketorolac, we have um, tenozicam, all of them like that. So plus or minus an adjuvant. And when you talk about adjuvants, these are other drugs or intervention that were not primarily developed for pain ab initio, but you can actually use them when you combine them with our regular analgesic they help in pain management i give you an example like amitriptyline amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant it was actually developed to manage depression however it's been noticed we noted that in neuropathic pain, patients with diabetic neuropathy, when you add amitriptyline to whatever you are giving them as pain management, it helps because don't forget that pain is not only sensory. There's also the emotional part of the experience. So that's an example of, of an adjuvant. Look at anesthetic. Injection of local anesthetic agent or nerve block can also serve as an adjuvant. We also have some other drugs like pregabalin, gabapentin can also serve as adjuvants. We also have alpha agonists, alpha 2 agonists like clonidine can also serve as adjuvants. So you start your pain management from a mild analgesic like acetaminophen 
or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, plus or minus some of these adjuvants that I've mentioned. If this pain still persists and is increasing, you move up to what is called a mild opioid. A mild opioid plus or minus an adjuvant. And when this pain still persists or increasing, then you have no choice but to use opioid plus or minus non-opioid and plus or minus adjuvant. So in essence, the management of pain, actually you need to combine medications or therapy, um, 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 you can combine psychotherapy, physical therapy, and even um, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic method. And I'm, I must say that management of pain should be a multidisciplinary approach. If a patient has cancer, of course, you know, if you don't remove the, the cancer, the pain will not go. So you need the intervention of the surgeon to take out this, the, 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 the cancer. And oncologists, which they are also drug to, it may not be through surgical means, it may be by chemotherapy. So you need everybody to be involved. So also if you have patients suffering from leukemia, you need hematologists, you need to join hands together. But what we are saying is that as anesthetist, who daily practice and make use of some of these drugs regularly, routinely in the theater and even outside the theater, they are the best manager of pain. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Now, the all what I have said, some of the drugs I've mentioned, if you, if you remember when we're talking about the pathophysiology, how this will be transducted, transmitted, and then it will be integrated, and then there will be perception from the brain, and then there will be modulation. If you look at all, at all, all these points, at transduction level, we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, antihistamine, opioids, and local anesthetics. If you remember, when we're talking about that part, uh, 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 part of that some chemical mediators were released. So that is what this NSAIDs, antihistamine, will go and block. Remember, prostaglandins, prostacycline, all those stuff like that. Then at the transmission level, that's where our local anesthetics, you can actually block them there, and opioids. Then when we talk about perception, you have opioids, uh, alpha-2 agonists, and uh, general anesthetics. Then when we talk about modulation, we talk about opioid, alpha-2 agonists, then NMDA receptor blocker. Example is ketamine, which is a drug that we anesthetists are very, very familiar with. So and it's, it is, um, ketamine is a very, very uh, good drug that we can use in several ways. We can, patient, you can, uh, you can give patients through virtually all the routes and you can use it if you know what you are doing um, to manage pain effectively. Next slide. Next slide. So in summary, a pain physician is a specialist who assesses and evaluates pain, classifies and grades it, and then treats it effectively. And I must say safely too. The specialist must have a detailed knowledge of the pathophysiology of pain, the pharmacology of pain medications, and must also be skilled in interventional procedures to relieve pain. He or she treats pain with drugs, different types of nerve blocks, spinal epidural radio frequency ablation, visco supplementation, implantation of tracheal pumps, spinal cord stimulators, and the world is going to stem cell treatment now. That's the future of pain management. Thank you. The last slide.
Next slide. Next slide. So in conclusion, based on the daily routine of anesthetics, vis-a-vis -vis working with some of the drugs that I've mentioned earlier on, they are best equipped to manage any kind of pain. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful presentation. Please, um, if you have a question, please, um, can you indicate or drop your question or comment? Thank you. Uh, if you have any question, please, can you uh, indicate? So I'll invite you to the stage to ask the question, or you can drop your question on the comment box. Uche, do you have any question? Yes, sir. It seems that none of them have questions for you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much sir, for accepting the invitation to tell us about um, payment management. Um, the lecture was actually interesting. I really learned a lot. And uh, I don't know, at the initial, I don't know that uh, pain have um, causes like some can be based on anatomy, um, either neuropathy. I, know, I always know of neuropathic pain and normal pain that somebody will feel it, but I don't know that there is some anesthetic pain and all the rest. So I really appreciate the lecture. Thank you very much, sir. You are most welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'll be ending the meeting um, later. There will be there will be a, a feedback form that will be sent to all of us. Please do it to fill our feedback form so we'll be able to get your certificate. Thank you and have a lovely day, a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Oh, wow.